the Parsha of Koirach is famous because it's all about Machloikas. Machloikas is generally not a foreign concept to Jews and to the Jewish community. It's something that we all know a thing or two about. Um, and as the Torah explains to us, uh, there's nothing new about the Jewish people and Machloikas. It's been going on for quite a while. Um, and here it is in the Parsha. Even in Moshe Rabbeinu's days, even Moshe Rabbeinu himself had his own fair share of Machloikas. The story you all, you all know, so we'll go through it briefly. Uh, there's one part that I'd like to highlight and discuss with you briefly this morning. So the Koira, the, the Machloikas in this case, the revolt, is led by a man named Koirach. Koirach, of course, is Moshe Rabbeinu's cousin because there's no politics, my dear friends, like family politics. And uh, Koirach is Moshe Rabbeinu's cousin and he leads a revolt uh, against Moshe Rabbeinu. The argument is basically that Moshe Rabbeinu is a self-appointed man, uh, that he is guilty of nepotism in appointing his brother to be the Kohen Godel. The argument is that Moshe Rabbeinu has no business being in this, holding this type of office and position of leadership over the Jewish people. Ki kol ha'eda kulam kadoshim, Moshe Rabbeinu says, uh, Koirach says, the whole Jewish nation is holy, um, everybody is connected to Hashem. And uh, Koirach tells Moshe Rabbeinu, there's no need for you to hold this type of office. Okay. Together with Koirach, the Pesach tells us, he gathers together um, Dosan and Aviram, right? Those two famous troublemakers. He gathers together, he gathers a man called Oin ben Pelis, which is not for today. He gathers together 250 Nesiei Edo, leaders of the community. Kriye Moyed An Sheshem, men of reputation. Um, leaders of the community, 250. This is, this is no simple deal. And as the Parsha goes on, the Torah makes it clear that Koirach gathered together the support uh, and had the backing of the entire Jewish community and leveled his revolt very personally against Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay. So once again, Moshe Rabbeinu finds himself in a difficult position of challenge. How does Moshe react? Vayishma Moshe, the Pesach says, Vayipol al Ponov, Moshe hears what's going on. He falls on his face and he tries to make peace with Koirach once and twice. He tries to talk sense into him. But Koirach in this case has found his platform. Uh, you know, he's riding high. He's got votes. He's got, you know, he's looking at a brighter future. He set his eyes on the corner office and uh, he's got stuff going on. So Koirach isn't interested in making peace with Moshe Rabbeinu. Koirach wants to fight. So Moshe Rabbeinu puts forth to them the following proposition. Moshe Rabbeinu says, why don't we do this? Why don't we have you, Koirach, and all of your 250 men, and everybody, who, all of the challengers, why don't we have everybody tomorrow morning, let every challenger, let's, let's stage a public showing here. Let's have a public showdown. We'll have everybody who is in a challenging position take a pan and put Ktoiris into it. And put fire into the pan. Let every man come forward and offer a Ktoiris and incense into Hashem. I'm reading here from Perak Tezayin, Posuk Zayin. V'hoyo ha'ish asher yivchar Hashem hu ha'kodesh. Hashem will make it clear who he wishes to choose, who is holy. Why don't we let Hashem settle this, says Moshe Rabbeinu. Why don't we let Hashem settle this? There's an old, there's an old Jewish joke, you'll forgive me. There's an old Jewish joke about a rabbi, a priest, and an imam, uh, and they're talking about how they handle money. You know, and the priest says, at the end of the day, when we gather together the pushka, or whatever they call it in, the, in their places of worship. He said, we gather together the pushka. He says, I go outside and I make a big tselem in the ground and I throw the money into the air and whatever lands in the tselem goes to charity and whatever lands outside of the tselem, I keep. And uh, you know, the, the Muslim goes, well, I go outside and I draw a big picture of a moon on the ground and I throw the money into the air and whatever lands in the moon 
goes to charity and whatever lands outside of the moon goes to me. And the rabbi goes, you know, basically I do the same. I take the pushka after davening and when nobody's looking, I go outside and I throw all the money into the air. And uh, whatever Hashem wants, Hashem can keep. But any money that falls down to the ground, uh, the rabbi says, the, the rest is for me. You know, whatever stays up in heaven is, belongs to tzedakah. <laughs> Everything else I keep. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, you know something? Why don't we let Hashem settle this? Let's all go out with a pen and with k'toros tomorrow. Let Hashem choose. And whoever Hashem, whatever Hashem decides, whoever Hashem decides, so it shall be. That person will be the next Koyan Godel. Okay. The Posuk doesn't fill in all the details. But the Gemara says that the proposal Moshe Rabbeinu put forward was not pretty. Moshe Rabbeinu told Koyrach, my dear friend, you are messing with something. You are playing with fire. This position that we're talking about here was appointed by Hashem. If you're going to challenge it, and if you're going to go through, I'm warning you, says Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem doesn't like what's going on. If you go through with this challenge, if you are not the one that Hashem has chosen to be Kohen Godel, you will pay for it with your life. The one who Hashem chooses to be the Kohen Godel, he'll be the one. Everybody else, Moshe warned Kairach, everybody else will perish and will die. And Kairach accepted. Now I'm going to read with you just a few lines from a Rashi in Posek Zion. It says Rashi, V'koyrach shepikeach hoya, Koyrach was a wise man, Ma ro l'shtus zeh. What did he see to possibly allow himself to engage in such shtus, in such stupidity? Why did Koyrach agree to this game of Russian roulette here with Moshe Rabbeinu and 250 of his men where Moshe Rabbeinu tells him, you are all going to die? Why would he agree to such a thing? In fact, in the end, as Moshe Rabbeinu warned them, Koirach did pay for it with his life, and so did all of his men. Koirach gets swallowed up in the ground. His men get, excuse me. His men get swallowed up in the ground. Koirach himself dies. His family dies. The 250 men who offer up the Katoiris, they're all consumed in a fire. Everybody perishes. Maro l'shtus zeh, says Rashi, maybe the other people weren't as intelligent as Koirach, but Koirach was a wise man. What motivated him? What, po- what could have possibly motivated him to engage in this kind of a thing? Says Rashi, I'll tell you. Enoi hit asoi, hit atu, he was fooled, he was deceived by something that he saw. Ro'o shal sheles g'doilo yoitzamimenu. He saw prophetically, so, which means Koyrach wasn't just wise and wealthy, by the way. Koyrach was also a prophet. He saw many descendants in the future who would come from him. Shmuel. Koyrach saw he had a descendant called Shmuel Sheshokel Kneged Moshe Aaron, who was as great as Moshe and Aaron combined. Omar Koyrach said, Bishviloy ani nimlat, in his merit I'll be saved. Chovdalad Mishmoris Oimdos Libnei Bonov, he saw 24 groups of Levim, his descendants, Kula Misnabim Beruach HaKodesh, all of whom would have prophecy, Ruach HaKodesh. Omar, he said, Efsher Kola Gdulo Hazois, Asidu Lamoid Mimeni, so much greatness is going to come from me. Bani Edom, and going, I'm, going to be, I'm going to be silent. So he accepted the challenge. He saw through prophecy that he would have a descendant called Shmuel, and he saw through prophecy that he was going to have 24 groups of Levim, prophets, descendants. He said, look at what great yichas I'm going to father. Look at all the children that I'm going to have in the schus of my tremendous yichas, future yichas, that is, I'm going to be saved. And Rashi concludes by saying Kairach was wrong. He didn't know that his children would do teshuvah. 
He didn't know that his children regretted it the last minute, and so they were saved. He didn't think it through, and so he ended up in the ground. End of Rashi. It seems when we study this Rashi that Rashi gives us more questions than he answers. So what's Rashi saying? Koirach saw through prophecy, Koirach saw through prophecy that he was going to have descendants. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, one person is going to live, everyone else is going to die. Koirach said, I know I'm going to be the one person who lives because I see the future. I'm going to have descendants. Shmuel Hanavi is going to come from me. Shmuel Hanavi is equivalent in greatness to Moshe and Aaron combined. 24 groups of Levim are going to come from me. Rashi says, in fact, what he saw was correct. He was right. All these people did come from him. And yet he himself perished. His children at the last moment did tshuva and they were saved. So wait a second. So Koirach was wise. Koirach was wealthy. Koirach was influential. Koirach was charismatic. Koirach was a prophet. Koirach fathered a novi called Shmuel, equivalent to Moshe and Aaron in greatness. And 24 groups of Levim, leaders of the Jewish people, all of that is true. But he couldn't figure out that you're not supposed to argue with Moshe Rabbeinu. He couldn't figure out that if Moshe Rabbeinu says this comes from Hashem, everybody else is going to perish, that his odds weren't very high. He couldn't figure out that you're not supposed to play Russian roulette with the lives of your, with your life, the lives of your families and the lives of the people who support you. He couldn't think of a different way. Such a, how does such a wise and wealthy and smart man make such a stupid mistake? What was his problem? If he could see through prophecy that he was going to have a grandson called Shmuel, then he couldn't figure out that Machloikas is not a good idea. He couldn't figure out to stay away from it. And Moshe Rabbeinu warned him to his face. Moshe Rabbeinu said, this is not going to end well for you. So he couldn't figure out that Moshe Rabbeinu tells you you're playing with your life, that it's not a good idea. Seems incredibly difficult to understand how this works. What motivated Koirach, a man whom the Torah describes as a pikeach? And even worse, or even more difficult to understand, not only does he convince his family and his friends and his close ones, but at some point convinces the entire Jewish nation, all of whom are ready to support him. You know, Koirach becomes the symbol of machloikas. Koirach becomes the symbol of dispute and strife and disharmony. The Gemara says, Kol amachzik b'machloikas. Anybody who stubbornly holds on to machloikas and refuses to let go, transgresses a mitzvah in the Torah which says, don't be like Koirach and his community. But Koirach wasn't the only one who made Machloikas. Last week we studied about the Maraglim. The Maraglim also made Machloikas. What is it about Koirach's Machloikas? What is it about Koirach uniquely that makes him the one who becomes the icon for Machloikas? Walk into any shul, walk into any school, walk into any community, huh? walk into any place where there are two rabbis. You'll find Machloikas, usually. Not difficult to find Jews that don't get along. Walk into any marriage. I mean, what, 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 what was it? Koirach patented Machloikas. Koirach was the one who conceived it. What is it about Koirach's battle uniquely that makes him the one, the symbol of Machloikas for all times, even, even till this day? The rabbis give a beautiful, beautiful explanation. And, and one which is, if you think about it, it's, it's, it speaks very much to, to the nature of what it is that many of us deal with. You know, there's that, famous, there's that famous medrash that says that Moshe Rabbeinu, to make his point, what there's brought to Moshe Rabbeinu a talis shakula tcheles. It's even, actually, it's even actually a Hebrew expression when you want to say, ironically, that somebody is no tzaddik, you say he's no talis shakula tcheles. He brought a talis that was completely tcheles and he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, no, Moshe Rabbeinu, tell me, is this talus obligated in tzitzis, yes or no? What did Koirach want with this talus shakula tcheles? And even more, why does this talus shakula tcheles 
Why does it become the symbol of Koyrach's Machlaitis? So here it is. Here's, here's the insight. Here's the insight. It's obviously not a problem for people to have different opinions. Otherwise, we as Jews would be doomed. It's obviously okay for people to feel differently and to express different opinions about things. Obviously, healthy dialogue and healthy discussion. At which point does it become a machloikas? At which point do we say, oh, no, 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 this has gone too far. It's now a machloikas. Maybe Koyrach was just engaging in some genuine, what do they call it in today's political world? People like to say, I'm just starting a conversation. Maybe Koyrach was just starting a conversation. At which point does something transition between, between something which is healthy and something which is unhealthy, something which is acceptable, something which is unacceptable? At which point do we tell a couple, you've gone too far? At which point do we tell a person, you're now responsible for machloikas. How do we know? There's one nuance here in the Parsha, which you can read a thousand times and miss, but the rabbis highlight it and it's very powerful. Koirach comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and he makes this fantastic speech. He says, Moshe, the whole community of the Jewish people, they're all holy. Madua tisnasu, why do you think you're special? The Jewish people are all Hashem's children. Now, who was it? I believe Winston Churchill said, all people are equal, some are more equal than others, right? Or something like that. He tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Ki kolo eido kulom kedoshim, everybody's holy. The Jewish people, he says to Moshe, this is when you know you're in trouble, by the way, when Koirach is lecturing you about the holiness of the Jews. The Jewish people all heard Hashem speak to Moshe Rabbeinu on Har Sinai. Kolo Eido Kulam Kedoshim. And the Pasuk describes Moshe Rabbeinu's reaction. And the first thing the Torah says, quote, Vayishma Moshe, Vayipol al Moshe listened and he fell on his face. And then he spoke. And he told Koyrach, you're playing with fire. He told Koyrach, this wasn't my idea. It was Hashem who anointed me. He told Koyrach, none of this was my decision. It all came from Hashem. He told Koyrach, everything you needed to tell Koyrach, he told Koyrach, you are playing with your life. But he didn't do any of that until he had listened. Vayishma Moshe, Vayipol al it was only after, it was only after Moshe Rabbeinu had listened to Kairach that he responded and then said what it is that he needed to say. What do I mean? Well, here it is. Here it is. The problem with Kairach wasn't that he was wise. It wasn't, excuse me, wasn't that he wasn't wise. The problem with Kairach wasn't that he wasn't holy. The problem with Kairach wasn't that he wasn't a scholar. Koirach was a charismatic, wise man with leadership capabilities and talents, with leadership qualities. Koirach was a motivator, right? What do they, the kids call it in today's world? In, in today's, Koirach was, a, uh, was an influencer. Any of you know what an influencer is? Koirach was a social media influencer before social media even existed. Koirach could get people going. Koirach was fantastic. So what was Koirach's problem? Where did he go wrong? The problem with Koirach was that he was so full of his own ideas and so full of his own thoughts and so full of his own wisdom and so full of his own prophecy that there was no room for anybody else. And when Moshe Rabbeinu came to him and warned him and said to him, my dear man, only one person is going to survive. Everybody else is going to die. Koirach reacted the way a narcissist does and says, well, if one person is going to survive, that's going to be me. Of course. Why? Because I think so. Because that's how I feel. 
And so even as people spoke to him, even as Moshe Rabbeinu himself spoke to him, Kairach had lost his ability to challenge himself and to see his own weaknesses. Kairach was the, was the icon of a man who says, I'm right because I think so, and couldn't see any other possibility or any other option. There's a very famous story in the Gemara. The Gemara relates in Masech the Menachas that when it came time for Hashem to give Moshe Rabbeinu the Torah, to take down to the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu was up there in Shemayim and he saw Hashem putting little lines on top of the letters in the Sefer Torah. And, Hashem said, and Moshe Rabbeinu said to Hashem, Hashem, what are those lines for? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know what those lines are for. And Hashem said to him, oh, those lines? In the future, there's going to be a man, Akiva ben Yosef Shmoy. For every one of these lines, he's going to expound mountains of halachas. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, really, that, that sounds amazing. Can I see that? Hashem says, sure, turn around. Moshe Rabbeinu turns around. He finds himself sitting in the back of Rabbi Akiva's classroom. Rabbi Akiva is teaching Torah to God knows how many students. And he's expounding, he's teaching halachas. The Gemara says, and Moshe Rabbeinu didn't understand. The Gemara says this. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't understand what, excuse me, what Rabbi Akiva was teaching. And he felt terrible. As he's sitting there in Rabbi Akiva's shear, not understanding one word Rabbi Akiva's teaching, feeling terrible, the following thing happens. The Gemara says from the front of the room, one of the students raises his hand. Rabbi, Rabbi, he says to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva. Yes, my dear student. This particular halacha that you're teaching right now, What's the source of this halacha? Where does it say this in the Torah? Rabbi Akiva says it doesn't say it anywhere in the Torah. How do we know it's true? We have a tradition that goes all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. Halacha le Moshe Nisinai. Hashem told this to Moshe Rabbeinu and Harsin. It was passed down through oral tradition. That's how we know the halacha. The Gemara says Moshe Rabbeinu at the back of Rabbi Akiva's classroom, hears ha Rabbi Akiva tell this to his students that the source of this halacha is halacha of Moshe Misinai. And Moshe Rabbeinu felt much better. The story goes on, but for now I want to highlight only this part of the story. And the commentaries explain, what does this mean? He heard Rabbi Akiva teaching Torah. He didn't understand what Rabbi Akiva was saying. He felt terrible. Then he heard Rabbi Akiva say, the source of this aloha is aloha labayshem isinai, and he felt much better. What was bothering him and what made him feel better? What was the problem and what was the solution? So they explained, simple. Moshe Rabbeinu saw Rabbi Akiva sitting and teaching Torah. Rabbi Akiva was the greatest, the most gifted Torah teacher of all times, Rabbi Akiva. Kulu aliba de Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara says. Rabbi Akiva gave us the whole Torah Shebaal Peh. He saw a man sitting there, overwhelmed with tremendous insights into Torah. And Moshe Rabbeinu became very concerned because it doesn't matter how wise you are. Well, it matters, but it's not, it doesn't ultimately matter. It doesn't matter how much Torah learning you've, you've amassed it doesn't matter how charismatic and how many Torah students you have. None of that is as important as when it's all done. You need to possess the character trait of humility. And if, Rahman al-Itzlan, you lose at some point the character trait of humility, you're guaranteed, guaranteed to lose your connection to Hashem. So Moshe Rabbeinu saw Rabbi Akiva teaching thousands of students, preserving the Messiah and saving everything holy. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, all of this is wonderful, but I don't see any humility here. Until the student asked Rabbi Akiva the source, what is the source of this? And Rabbi Akiva said, oh, the source? 
This is what we received from our teachers who received it all the way back from Moshe Rabbeinu, the most humble of all men. And when Rabbi Akiva, and when Rabbi Akiva said those words, Moshe Rabbeinu saw, caught a glimpse into a man who possessed not just titanic intellect, but a humble soul and a humble spirit. And one who could tell his students in truth, I'm not just a Torah teacher. I'm also a humble student of my teacher who learned it from his teacher all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. The magic ingredient in being a Torah Yid, the magical ingredient in being a Jewish leader, the magical ingredient in being an effective Torah leader is the character trait of humility. And that's the very thing that Koirach lacked. He didn't lack prophecy. He didn't lack insight. He didn't lack abilities. He was gifted in everything. He didn't lack yichas, right? Not in the yichas he came from and not in the yichas he was going to. He didn't lack any of that. What he did lack was humility. He lacked the ability to listen. He couldn't hear. And because of that, he was unfit to be a Jewish leader. And he became, he became, notwithstanding all of his Torah learning, he became his own worst enemy and destroyed himself. I'll give you another example of this. The time, you know, if any of you have ever done jury duty, you'll know that there's something called a hung jury. What's a hung jury? A hung jury means where the entire jury cannot come to you unanimous decision. Hung jury. In the Sanhedrin, in the Torah's, in the Torah's legal system, you also need, uh, uh, the, the halacha is paskin based on roiv, based on the majority. You go to a bezdin, you ask them a question. When it comes to matters of life and death, you need a majority of two, etc. cetera, uh, uh, to, to declare a person guilty, you need a majority of two. Halacha gets paskin based on roiv. The Gemara discusses the following scenario. The Gemara says, what happens if, let's say, the Sanhedrin, the, the high court is sitting and it's, I don't know, let's say, God forbid, a murder trial or something like that. And the case is so cut and dry. The case is so clear that 23 judges all unanimously agree, or 71 judges all unanimously agree, this individual is guilty. Everybody agrees. The Gemara says he's not guilty. He walks. Everybody agrees that he did the crime. Everybody agrees he should face the penalty. He doesn't face the penalty. He doesn't get capital punishment if all the judges agree that he is in fact guilty. The simple reason for this is what's called Xerus Akosov. We learn it from the Pasuk. You need at least one judge, at least one of the 23 judges that are necessary in order to judge life and death cases. At least one judge needs to say, I think he's innocent. If 22 say innocent and one, excuse me, if 22 say guilty and one says innocent, he's guilty. But if all 23 say guilty, he's not guilty. What's the reason? Simple, the rabbis explain. Simple. If an entire Sanhedrin sits down to judge a case, if an entire Bezdin sits down to hear a story, and not one, not one of the judges can find a zchus for this person, not one of them can see a merit, not one of them can see something in him that is worthwhile of saving. All 23 agree unanimously this guy needs to be written off and done away with. If nobody sees a zchus in him at all, we're concerned that none of them are listening. We're concerned that none of them are paying attention. We're concerned that none of them are seeing him for who he truly is. We're concerned that they're all missing something and missing something profound. And because of that, we'll disqualify an entire Besden. You're not listening, will tell the Besden. You're not hopping, you're not hearing, you're missing something that's going on. 
when a person doesn't have the ability, when a person doesn't have the skill of listening, when a person doesn't have the ability, the quality of humility, it's difficult to reason with this person because they're so incredibly convinced that they're right. And they can give you proofs and they can give you explanations and they can convince a myriad of people that they are in fact correct and they can do so effectively. And they can stand up there and say, I'm a talis shekula tcheles. And we say to you, yes, you're a talis shekula tcheles. You are so full of your own tcheles. You are so full of your own righteousness. You're so full of your own holiness. It's incredible. You've forgotten your own fallibility. You've forgotten your own humility. You've forgotten... <laughs> You've forgotten who you are. You've gotten lost somewhere in your head. You're on an ego trip. This has become all about you. Guaranteed to fail. This is Koirach. Talis Shakula Tchelis. A man who studied Torah, a man who influenced others, a man who had everything going for him. You know, the rabbis say the same analogy Kairach gave. He gave a talis shakul He also said, what about a home that's full of sforim? Bayis mole sforim. Does it need a mezuzah? Same question. A bayis mole sforim full of Torah learning? Does it need a mezuzah, yes or no? Kairach had a hard time. Kairach had a hard time with this. Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, my dear friend, you are so mistaken. Moshe said, you think I want this? You think I'm here because, because of me? You know what makes a leader qualified to be a leader? You know what makes him, puts him in position where he can be a leader over Jews? The fact that he doesn't want it. The fact that Hashem came to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, you're going to be the Moshe Rabbeinu, the one to take the Eden out of Golas, out of Mitzrayim. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, Lo ish anoichi, I can't talk. I am a man of, 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 I'm a man who is incoherent. My lips are blocked. I can't communicate. Hashem said, it's going to be you. And I, Hashem, will communicate through you. Was Moshe Rabbeinu the greatest Torah, Torah scholar that ever lived? Of course. Was he the greatest was he the greatest Rosh Hashiva, the greatest miracle worker, the, the, the greatest the, the greatest Navi, the greatest everything? Of course. Is that what made him Moshe Rabbeinu? No. So what was it that made him the Moshe Rabbeinu? His, his humility. His ability to look at another Yid, even a Koirach Lahavdil. Even a Koirach. And before he said one word, in response to Kairach, the first thing he did was he listened. Vayishma Moshe. Even to a Kairach, Moshe Rabbeinu listened. And when he did, and only after he did, did, did Moshe Rabbeinu then respond and say what he needed to say to Kairach. I'll give you a tool, a litmus test that you can use for the rest of your lives to know where the two people engaged in differing of opinions are doing so in, an, in a healthy or an unhealthy way. Never fails. Watch two people, even if they fiercely disagree with each other. Watch them interact with each other and ask yourself only one simple question. Are they listening to each other or not? Are they so convinced that they're right that they're waiting to jump down each other's throats? Are they so convinced that every thought that goes, goes through their head is 100% justified because this is what I think? Then it's an unhealthy machloikas and will end in disaster. Are they, are they willing to listen? Are they willing to truly, honestly listen to what the other person is saying? If yes, then it's a machloikas then it's for the sake of heaven. Then each one wants the truth and they will find it. 
Perhaps the truth is that both opinions are right. Hillel and Shammai, the Mishnah says, both had their point, both had their perspective, both legitimate, both part of Tyra. But they always listened to each other because it was never about them. And so they always found legitimacy in another person, even when they disagreed with him. They were always able to see value in somebody else. Here it is in a nutshell. What made Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu? What made him, so what, what was, so to speak, the difference between Moshe and Koirach ultimately? In Koirach, Koirach saw leadership. Koirach saw the position that he sought. He saw it, it was all about himself. Koirach was looking to be the leader. Moshe Rabbeinu understood that leadership is never about the leader. Leadership is about the Jews. Leadership means humility. Leadership means listening to others. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu understood. Moshe understood the humility element of leadership that Koirach never did. And for this reason, and this reason primarily, Koirach becomes the icon of Machloikas. Machloikas means you and I are locked in dispute where the dispute becomes personal because I think I'm right because it's me and you think you're right because it's you. And when you and I are locked in a dispute which is personal, it ne- doesn't matter what the issue is. We can never make shalom because it's my ego against yours. And so we're stuck in that. But when, when two people are locked in a machloikas shehi l'shem shemayim, then it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about what Hashem wants from both of us. And this is something, even in in a situation like that, one can always see value, even in someone else, even with whom, someone with whom we disagree. It's not a problem. Too often, too often in Jewish homes, in Jewish marriages, in Jewish communities, in Jewish shuls, and in Jewish schools, machloikas takes hold. And when machloikas takes hold, machloikas is like a, Rahman Litzlan, it's like a cancer. Once it takes hold, it spreads. And once it spreads, it destroys, unfortunately, everything. It eats it up until, until unfortunately, sometimes leaves devastating, devastating results. What is it that's so poisonous about this machloikas? What is it that, 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 that kills everything in its wake? What is the, the heart of the poison? The heart of the poison is the ego, where it becomes all about me. And so the Torah here in Parshas Koirach highlights to us in truth, what does it mean to be a Jewish leader? You want to be in a position where you're going to motivate other Jews? You want to be, Koirach said, look at me, I can motivate Jews. Moshe Rabbeinu said, you're going to end up in the ground dead if you don't stop. Koirach couldn't stop. He was locked in an ego trip and he couldn't see past it. Moshe Rabbeinu said, I never wanted this job in the first place. I'm here as an emissary of Hashem. And as I do, as I do, I find beauty in other Jews. Koirach, now here's the tricky part. Koirach uses the words, kol ho'eda kulam kadoshim. You see, people who make machloikas, they're never honest with you about their agenda. Koirach says, the whole nation is holy. We don't need leaders. And what does he really mean? He really means, I want to be the leader, not you. Moshe Rabbeinu says, the Jewish people do need a leader. But what he really means is that it is the job of that leader to promote the value of every single you he comes in contact with. To listen to them, to see them as different to, see, to find their, inher- their, their value and to lift them up. There's an old Hasidic tale about two children who were playing Rebbe and Chosid. They were actually sons of the Rebbe Maharash, the fourth Rebbe of Chabad. He had two sons. When they were children, they were playing a game, Rebbe and Chosid. And the one who's playing Chosid goes in to see the one who's playing Rebbe. And he says, Rebbe, I need a tikkun. I've done a particular sin. I need a, I need a program for tshuva. I need to be able, how, how do I fix what it is that I've done? 
And the other one says to him, well, you need to pay more attention when you daven. You need to pay more attention when you study Torah. Here's your program of teshuva. And the young boy who later, up grew, who later grew up to become the Rebbe his own, in his own right, says to his older brother, that's not how a Rebbe answers. I asked you a question, you gave me an answer. That's not how a leader answers. Why not, says the brother, what did I do wrong? I gave you such a beautiful answer for your question. He said it to him in Yiddish. He said, you didn't sigh before you answered. Why is it so important that you sigh before you answer? Because when you sigh before you answer, you show me that you feel my pain. When you sigh before you answer, you show me that you're not throwing a book at me. You're talking to me as a human being. When you sigh before you respond, you understand that you as a leader see value in me as a person. And when you do that, I feel validated. I feel like you're having a conversation with me. Anybody can throw a shulchan aruch at anybody else and say, here's what it says in the book. You don't need a Jewish leader for that. You want to be a Rebbe? You want to be a Jewish leader? You want to be a student of Moshe Rabbeinu and of Rabbi Akiva? Where's your humility? Tell me that you see something in me. Give a krecht. Feel what somebody else is going through. And then you and I will have a conversation. You know, my friends, when you sit in the presence of somebody who is a genius, when you sit in the, friends, in the presence of somebody who is incredibly wise, gifted intellectually, you walk away feeling stupid. Or I should say I. Walk away feeling stupid. Because I walk away thinking, oh my God, compared to that individual, I'm stupid. And I'm right. I am stupid compared to them. When you walk away with people who have tremendous gifts, you walk away feeling small about yourself because compared to that person, I am small. When you walk away from a person who is a godl, who is a giant, when you sit in the presence of somebody who is larger than life, you walk away feeling small about yourself because compared to that person, I am small. And that was Kairach. Kairach was a big man, wealthy physically, wealthy spiritually. Kairach said, I should be the leader. Look how big I am. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, you're no leader. You're just a man on an ego trip. Maybe a justified ego trip, maybe a not justified ego trip. It doesn't make any difference. An ego trip always ends in disaster. It doesn't matter how talented you are. The ego will destroy everything and leave nothing in its wake. You want to know what a leader is, says Moshe Rabbeinu? I'll tell you. A leader is somebody who can find and elevate and lift up everybody else. When you sit in the presence of a true Jewish leader, a man of faith, when you walk away, you feel elevated. When you walk away, you feel great. When you walk away, you feel powerful because that Jewish leader believes in every one of us and sees the potential in us even when we don't see it in ourselves or dare I say, bedavka when we don't see it in ourselves and tells us, and tells us that we can. How do you know when you're sitting in the presence of a man who is connected to Hashem? When that person sees that connection to Hashem in you too, and you walk away feeling, you walk away with a sense of being elevated about yourself. When you walk away not feeling small and crushed by a person who's got a bigger ego than you, but by a person who sees potential and greatness in you, even sometimes when you don't see it yourself. I got three minutes left, so I want to say this. Today is Gimel Tammuz in the Chabad calendar. It's a very special day because it's the 26th yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The Rebbe became Rebbe, took the position of leadership of Chabad uh, in 1950. This was five years after the conclusion of the Holocaust and, and the darkest hour of our people's history. 
I don't need to tell it to you. Some of you who are here today are survivors. Many of you are children of survivors. Um, it was the darkest hour of our people's history. That's the truth. It was. And even as the Jewish nation began, began to digest the impact that this had, this, this had had on us, there was tremendous fear for the future, where Jews, Rahman al-Islam, only wanted, in many cases, only wanted to have their children not even know that they were Jewish, so they wouldn't face that type of anti-Semitism and, 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 and brutality that they faced. And the Rebbe's message from day one to every Jew he came in contact with and to every Jew that would listen to him, and even many, even many who wouldn't, the Rebbe taught every single Jew every single day that a Jew is powerful and a Jew is capable and a Jew is eternal and a Jew is holy and a Jew is pure. And he sought to promote that and push that in every single person he came in contact with. And he told every Jew in one form or another, as a Jewish leader, he said to them, I believe in you. You can and you will and you will succeed. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. Do what you need to do. Embrace your life's shlichus. Embrace it with enthusiasm and passion. He found a way, even with those who disagreed with him, even with those who disagreed with him fiercely, he found a way to teach everybody that in his opinion, in, from his perspective, there is value to be found. We need to find a way, the Rebbe said, to elevate every single Jew and make them see their own power and their gifted abilities. Here's a story. So the Rebbe was once talking to a school teacher. And the Rebbe tells the teacher, you know, you teach children, yes? Yes. What age? Seven-year-old children. Amazing, the Rebbe says. You know, when you teach these children the lessons that you give them, because they're so young and they're so impressionable, will stay with them for the rest of their life. You know this? Think about what kind of an impact you have. And then when these children grow up, maybe some of them will become teachers and they'll be able to take these wisdoms and lessons that you've given them. They can maybe then teach them to their students and maybe their students to theirs. Think about how far reaching the ripple effect of what you're doing. It's just unbelievable. The Rebbe says to him, you can change the whole world. <laughs> it was very typical of his style. And the individual became very uncomfortable. He said, Rebbe, they spoke in Hebrew. The Rebbe said, he said to the Rebbe, Rebbe, you're talking to me about changing the whole world. However, I am but a simple Jew. I'm just trying to do my job, collect my paycheck, pay rent, excuse me, feed my family, and live a simple life. I'm not trying to change the world. And the Rebbe said to him, I'm also just a simple Jew. What are we all? Just simple Jews. But every Yehudi Pashut is connected to Hashem. Every Yehudi Pashut has within themselves an Hashem. Every Yehudi Pashut has infinite power and abilities. Don't look at yourselves, said the Rebbe. We're not victims. Said the Rebbe, we're not downtrodden. We're not weak. We're not incapable. We're not handicapped. We're not damaged. We're not struggling for survival. Ki monu keil, Hashem is with us. We are invincible and infinitely powerful. We are capable beyond what we believe we are, as long as we embrace it. My job, said the Rebbe, is not to convince anybody that I am great. My job, said the Rebbe, is to convince you that you're great. My job is not to push my agenda on anybody, said the Rebbe. My job is to teach every Jew that he or she, child, 
young child across all ages and across all spectrums, that every Jew comes into this world with a mission of Hashem. And he or she needs to pursue it with everything they have because they can change the world if they realize who they are. Koirach said, it's all about me. Koirach said, I am powerful. I will be a Jewish leader because of how great I am. Moshe Rabbeinu said to him, your greatness notwithstanding, you're no leader. You're not fit to hold this position of office, not even for a minute. If it's all about you, then go back to where you came from. You want to be a Moshe Rabbeinu? Start listening. Start looking. Start seeing the greatness in other people. Ah! Ezehu chacham aloymed mikolodam. Amazingly, the more you build up others and the more you see their potential and their ability, the greater you yourself become. The more of a Moshe Rabbeinu, the more of a Moshe Rabbeinu you are. Is it okay for Jews to disagree? Yes, of course. Of course it is. Is it okay for Jews to have different minhagim and different ways and different shittas and different beliefs? Yes, of course. It's been this way since day one. Is it okay for every Jew to do things, to have their own opinion? Absolutely. For as long as there are, Hashem creates every person with their own mind, as long as Hashem puts us all in this world, every one of us has our own shlichas and what it is that we need to accomplish in our, in our, in our own way. As a proud, card-carrying, Kool-Aid-drinking, one who tries to be a chosid and a student of the Lubavitcher Rebbe every single day. The Rebbe taught us that we become great not through putting other people down, but through lifting them up. The Rebbe taught us that we are effective, that we, are, we, do, we fulfill the shlichus that Hashem put us in this world to do, not when we walk around and tell other Jews how bad they are, but when we walk around and tell other Jews how wonderful and how amazing they are, when we find a way to lift and promote and believe, believe in other Jews. You know, I heard, I heard somebody once complain to the Rebbe. He said, Rebbe, your Hasidim are all a little bit, uh... <laughs> they got a couple of screws loose. You know, they got a couple of loose screws up there. What do you mean, the Rebbe said? He said, they talk about you. He said to the Rebbe, they talk about you a little bit obsessively. You know, they're a little bit uh, abyssal mashuga. Why are your Hasidim so crazy about you? The Rebbe said, I'll tell you why. My Hasidim are obsessed with me because I'm obsessed with them. My Hasidim are crazy over me because I'm crazy over them. And my Hasidim believe in me because I believe in them. That's what a Moshe Rabbeinu does. A Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't promote himself. It's not a self-promoting agenda. A Moshe Rabbeinu is there to look at another Yid and say, I believe in you. I see it in you. You can. You will. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to be afraid of. Other than fear alone. Don't let your own Yetzirah convince you that you can't when you can. May his neshama have an aliyah on this very special day. May all of us learn from his example to always seek and to search and to find the positive in every situation, even in difficult ones. To learn to see the positive, to the neshama within every single yid. To always listen like Moshe Rabbeinu did, by Yishma Moshe, even to a Kairach, and to understand, to understand that as long as we're building each other up, as long as we're, we remain connected to Hashem, who put all of us in this world to accomplish tremendous things, then we're all truly in this together. Kol ho'edo kulam kadoshim, the entire nation of Hashem is holy. Koirach's words were true. They didn't come from a good place. What he said is true. And therefore it is recorded in Torah. And it's up to us to find that truly with humility in every single yid, including ourselves. Have a wonderful Shabbos.